Welcome to worship with us this week at Grace Communion Orlando. For those of you who own a pet, have you ever played the shame game with them? There's a current online trend called pet shaming where people post pictures of their pets wearing signs confessing their misdeeds. And we've got a couple of those pictures on screen. One with a dog saying, I eat socks, and the cat next to him saying, I supply the socks. And of course, of course, we've all, uh, if you've ever had a pet that's had surgery, had to put them through the cone head embarrassing stage. And there's another picture here of our own eight-year-old English cream dachshund. His name is Walker. And he has just drugged the cushion off a patio chair to make himself a nice, comfortable spot to lay down. And he's looking at me. There's no, he's, I got no regrets. I'd do this again, Dad. Well, owners know that posting pictures of their pets and exposing these misdeeds won't really change their pets' behavior or make them good, but they're humorous. Shame and blame don't create real behavior changes in animals, and they aren't that effective for real change in humans either. There have been actual public shaming sentences for some people in the U.S. where they've had to wear signs announcing what they did. And this can range from having a fluorescent colored license plate to their car that warn about past driving under the influence of DUI record, or wearing a large placard sign for eight hours for domestic abuse. And there's plenty of discussion about whether this public shaming is an effective deterrent for crimes. In fact, psychologists continue to question whether shame and blame actually change behavior. Blame is a defense mechanism. We've all used it at one time or another. And shame is what tells us we're not good enough, we'll never be good enough, Hopefully, we have learned that shame and blame, those games, uh, are games that everyone loses. Licensed counselor Andrea Matthews writes this about blame and shame in her article in Psychology Today. Unfortunately, this game is so commonly used that we don't really even notice it much until it gets out of hand. When children shame children over social media so badly that the victim decides to suicide, we notice it. But we don't tend to notice it in everyday interactions with our children, our spouses, our families, or our friends. But it's always there, lurking around in the thoughts, if not in the body language, the tones of voice, and even the words of our interactions. Good words from Andrea Matthews. God isn't interested in shaming his children. He is interested in repentance and change. But some churches spend a lot of time on the shaming aspect. God created humanity. He understands how we're made. We respond to love and kindness and shut our hearts to shame and blame. Christ's sacrifice is evidence that we don't have to make penance or feel ashamed of our human brokenness. Repentance, the Greek word is metanoia, is all about a change of mind brought about by the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the healthy part of repentance is this freeing of our guilty conscience from dead works, which Paul speaks of. The personal and total sacrifice of our Savior has once and for all dealt with our sin, yours and mine. Let's read about that in Hebrews chapter 9. We've been in the book of Hebrews here for the last couple of weeks. Hebrews 9, verses 24 through 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. What can we notice about this passage in Hebrews? First, <clears throat> some context, this message is not to Gentiles, but to Hebrews by the very title of the book. Jewish Christians who are being persecuted and tempted to leave Christianity and return to Judaism. Hebrews is the only New Testament book that discusses Jesus Christ.
Christ as our high priest, connecting him with the Old Testament priest Melchizedek. The main purpose of the letter is to show the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. And so these verses compare and contrast Christ's sacrifice with the Levitical high priest who entered the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle on one day each year. The need for annual sacrifices presented by the high priest interposed the religious system. It was deeply connected with it, in this case Judaism. And it became a mediator between the people and God. And the writer of Hebrews points out the clear superiority of Christ who did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, not the tabernacle in the wilderness, but appears in heaven now and who did not have to offer himself again and again as the high priest had to offer sacrifices every year. This highlights Jesus as fully divine as well as fully human. No longer is there a need for anyone to be the mediator between the people and God. Jesus, our high priest, is that mediator. Though the repetition of the annual sacrifices reminded the people of Israel of their sinfulness, it also reinforced blame and shame, and it created a sin rut, one that they could see no way out of, that they can continually offering for themselves to try and, in a ritual sense and in a symbolic way, clear the conscience. But blame and shame do not show the way out of the rut. Christ's sacrifice, made in love, was done once, and our repetition of it found in our own ritual of communion, where we invite and remember, now reminds us that love showed us the way out of the sin right. That's a rut that you don't want to get stuck in. In verse 26, the word, the word translated sin is actually a Greek word hamartia in the singular, not plural. However, because the letter is addressed to a community, it, pe it appears that this is talking about the sin in a collective sense, as if Christ's sacrifice was intended to dismantle the systems of sin, big S, that are participated in by many people collectively, all our sin, either knowingly or unknowingly. This is the focus of the Hebrew word. God is concerned about human-made systems of oppression that create suffering for humanity as a whole, worldwide. In addition, the passage makes us think about how we still scapegoat and shame and blame people. This is particularly true for people who differ from us in race or gender, belief systems, political views, to name a few differences. In some respects, it's, a, it's as if we have our own sacrificial system that uh, has its levels of placing blame on others. Christ's sacrifice once for all means we don't have to sacrifice each other in a negative spiral of shame and blame. The last half of verse 26 makes, makes use of the Greek perfect tense, showing that not only was Christ's sacrifice important at that moment in history, but it's still in force today and into eternity. It's as if humanity is being lifted out of the sin rut of shame and blame by the arms of love in an ongoing effort. As we read, and just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. These verses remind us of our mortality, our impermanence, something that we often try to forget or feel as if it's something we need to apologize for. But our elder brother, Jesus Christ, was also mortal. He was fully human and fully divine, but he was sinless. It was his mortal humanity that made his sacrifice possible. Who better to understand our weakness than the one who has been tested as we are, yet without sin? Here we are reminded that Christ promised to return, not to deal with sin, but to save or usher in salvation in the form of God's kingdom or system on earth for those who could love him and those who do love him. Christ's second coming is not about sin, shame, or blame. It's about love, a transforming love that looks forward to establishing God's righteous rule on earth. How can we apply this, this understanding to our daily lives? Well, first, we can remind ourselves of our value in God's sight 
and let his love transform us. Reading from Paul's words to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. When we understand that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit know us intimately, the good and the bad, and yet love us without reservation, remember Christ's sacrifice once for all? It's as if our cup of love is filled and we can overflow to others. We are not known or identified by sin or sinful behavior. That is all taken care of in Christ. God sees us in our true identity, his beloved children. In fact, the New Testament calls us saints because we have inherited and have received by imputation some of his righteousness. We still stumble, but our righteous king looks at us through the eyes of the one who offered all. We participate with Jesus, and through the Holy Spirit, he will lead us to change. We become better people as a result of God's love flowing in us and through us. Secondly, when we celebrate communion, we do so by understanding how we have been set free from the sin rut. Reading again just a little, little earlier in the book of Hebrews from chapter 9 and verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? Each time we celebrate communion together at the Lord's table, we're reminding ourselves and each other that we are not shamed or blamed by God for our shortcomings. In fact, His Holy Spirit convicts us and leads us out of sin. Instead, we're held as precious, worthy, worth, worth every life. Um, once for all, Jesus offered His life for ours. Love has lifted us, lifted us up out of that sin rut. And in loving our others, we participate with Christ in helping them to exercise that freedom that they have. And then we examine ourselves for ways that we still engage in patterns and shaming and blaming others. I mean, this shame and blame game goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And it takes the new garden, the new Jerusalem, and the king of that city to free us from it. In Luke chapter 6, the gospel writer shares this in verse 42. Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself don't see the log in your own? You know, our culture encourages us to point fingers, compare ourselves, and engage in other shaming and blaming behaviors. By remembering who we are in Christ and by remembering others as God's beloved, we can ex express a transforming love toward them, even in situations where holding them accountable is necessary. We remember that shame and blame don't change people. Love does. And so when we talk about not shaming and not blaming, we're not, we're not saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't convict us of sin. John 16 reminds us that he does, but he doesn't shame us and leave us there. Even though the pictures of the guilty pets we saw a few minutes ago are funny, shaming and blaming each other isn't. Shame and blame are used to put others down, the opposite of what God calls us to do, and they're ineffective means of getting someone to change. As the lyrics of Daryl Evans' contemporary worship song go, I'm trading my sorrows, the title, remind us that we're laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness and I'm trading my pain, I am laying them down for the joy of the Lord. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have reached out to humanity in loving sacrifice once for all so that we could be transformed by love and then extend that transforming love to one another. May God help us to share his love and life with others through the good news that Jesus removes our shame and there's no reason to blame. Let's pray about that. Gracious God, empower us to live as children of the light, reflecting your goodness, your joy, your patience, your forgiveness, reflecting your love. Purge our conscience from dead works. Protect us from the ac accusations of the evil one in this world whose goal is to lie and murder, to belittle and accuse. 
belittling the work of God in the children of God. Help us not absorb that spirit, but instead lean on yours. Help us lean on the one who now appears in heaven on our behalf, our Lord, who has once for all removed our sin. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We share our benediction today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all the church said, Amen. We'll see you next time.